Bradley, are you are you implying that British culture and American culture has differences? I, I might be. Oh, I know, it's, I know it's shocking. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris are rejoined by Bradley James to address the question: Is the term Western developer too broad? Plus, impressions of Overwatch and Hearthstone whispers of the old gods. The Backward Compatible Doc on podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 64 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, I'm here, everybody. And I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And rejoining us uh, after quite a bit of time is our good friend and our favorite Brit, uh, Bradley James. Uh, oh, I'm your favorite Brit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> maybe my favorite, top three. Maybe? Uh, official Brit of the show. We'll go with that. <laughs> and then oh, you were, yeah, definitely. The official Brit of the show. Well... I think uh, I think today uh, Bradley might be added, giving us a little more than a splash of academia, mm-hmm. since our meaty topic is actually going to be covering or at least touching on some of the work that he's that you're doing on your uh, thesis. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, well, my, my current uh, PhD thesis is has been what well, has been because it's my third year now <laughs> has been uh, theorizing uh, the idea that the Western game industry is actually fragmented a little bit more than what it's currently perceived as. Mm. Uh, that's by like the general populace, the industry, and people that, who work in it. Um, they're they're always quite quick to define the Western in specific, very uh, niche ways rather than taking it farther because western pretty much applies to everywhere in the world but like asian countries like japan and Mm -hmm. china and stuff which is great which was crazy to me hence why i decided to study it further and then i was told it was phd worthy and here i am three years later (laughs) (laughs) awesome Uh, well i think we're going to open up with our uh, usual opening segments uh but today instead of the button mosh we're opening up with hashtag get wrecked it's time to hashtag get wrecked with some talk about competitive multiplayer games. All right, so um, what we want to talk about today, and I know, Bradley, this is stuff that's been uh, near and dear to your heart uh, recently. Um, the Overwatch beta and the uh, the Hearthstone, the new expansion, uh, Whispers of the Old Gods, which um, both Blizzard titles, uh, so I guess Blizzard's kind of been capturing a lot of our attention recently. Uh, what is, uh, I guess, first of all, we'll start with Overwatch. What were your impressions of the beta? I, okay, first off, I want to state something. I am a huge a T- Team Fortress 2 fan. Mm. I've played probably well over 10,000 hours of that game in its life cycle. I love the game mm. to absolute death. I haven't played it a lot recently because I've been you know, working and I've, I've had a lot of uh, time away from it. But I've loved that game. And I picked up Overwatch, only watching a couple of reviews about it, reading about it like online and stuff. You know, And I picked it up and I fell in love with it. I felt like... I felt like it was at the point where Team Fortress 2 was was out for maybe two, three years, where it's all got that point where they were starting to add um, uh, like sort of hidden lore, character backgrounds, like they extended past the meet the videos from Team Fortress. They added like more sort of flavor to the game as a whole, which sort of gave it this whole sort of scope of being a much bigger universe than it was. It wasn't just a class-based shooter. It was a class-based shooter with characters you loved and enjoyed. Mm-hmm. And I feel like Overwatch has started there. And that was what that was where TF2 went from another level of game of game for me, mm. and I was, I loved it. I mean, I'm, I feel like you know my my wife turned around to me, and watched me play it, and said, you know, this is basically Team Fortress Three, mm. effectively is, and that's probably one of the biggest compliments you can give it because, as a class based shooter, it just does it so well. Like everything is is just beautiful. That the environments are fantastic and full of like crazy amounts of lore and flavor. The characters are emotive. They're very well made. They've been very well sort of. Like they fit so well into the world, it, it's just I'm I'm stunned. I was absolutely stunned, and I was absolutely I, I, I adored the whole time I was playing. I could not stop playing. It was absolutely ridiculous. I'm having like withdrawal symptoms. So I was Overwatch, and I sort of tick. I'm like, eh, no, I, this bed is not over. <laughs> it's horrifying. Wow. I, 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 so, I, I was so shocked. I'm so, so shocked. So Bradley, uh, who's who's your favorite character in the game, or do you do you actually just kind of play all of them? I, I actually I actually I have a special place for Tracer. 
because mm. she's in like horrifically British. It's like, Cheers, <laughs> love. <laughs> the cavalry's here. And it's like, oh my lord. My uh, funny thing is, I was playing. I was playing with my friend, my, my friend Sam, and he turned around to me, and goes, "I really would love Tracer if she, Tracer if she didn't sound like an 18th century sat nav." <laughs> <laughs> because she sounds because the thing is is that her accent sounds like an American putting on a British accent yeah. it's like that Gee, you know I'm a British lady <laughs> <laughs> and we looked up her voice actress the voice actress is English <laughs> so how, she's doing ask. an American accent which it sounds like an English accent from an English I was like how does that even work it's like <laughs> Pretty talented voice actors, like overacting. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, I also really enjoy uh, Roadhog. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, Roadhog reminds me a lot of uh, Stitches from Heroes of the Storm with that the hook he throws out. For those who don't know, he his, his uh, um, shift ability or uh, control ability is he throws out a hook which hooks people in, brings them close, and then he hits them in the face with his big old scrap shotgun. And I just I just love grabbing people out of nowhere and them going Whoa! and then dying. It's hilarious. <laughs> Yeah, I've actually been enjoying Overwatch a bit myself. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of Team Fortress 2, and it could have just been that I came in so late that my, my skill level is so horrendously low that I would just get obliterated by anyone I was playing against. Um, and so maybe just years later, I'm a little bit better. But for some reason, I found that Overwatch, if I find a character that I kind of uh, I, I enjoy playing as, there's something about the feel of the game that makes it feel a lot more accessible. And so I, there's definitely room for me to grow and uh, improve my skills as a player. Um, but I don't like online shooters, I don't like MOBAs, but for some reason I find myself kind of liking this. Um, Blizzard seem to do that, though. I don't know how they do it, but they seem to do that with their games. They seem to take you, like, I, I don't like MOBAs, really, I've never really liked MOBAs that much, but I absolutely adore Heroes of the Storm and play it all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the only MOBA I can stand, and it's crazy, like, I've never been a massive shooter fan like TF2 was the only real shooter I've put any time into and for years I didn't really look at any sort of online shooters vaguely I, I played a bit of time for when it came out and such and such but this I, I could see myself playing this for hours and hours on end I don't know how they do it I, I genuinely genuinely don't know how Blizzard do it it's, it's mm-hmm. crazy absolutely yeah. crazy be something I think uh, down the road I'm going to have to try to sort of self-analyze a little bit more and see if I can put a finger on what it is um, I do think that part of it especially with the characters that are deemed easier to play um, that there's sometimes no weapon switching um, and maybe that's part of it is that you get a feel for that specific weapon and you just learn how to use it strategically as opposed to feeling like you have to switch weapons constantly and know which tool to use when um, and there's an element of that with certain characters but like for Tracer for example it's just like a little blinky moves her recall mm-hmm. and her two pistols and that's well, it well there's like um, and I, I have not played much of it at all but my impression just of Blizzard in general from playing lots of other Blizzard games as well is they do a really good job making um, games that initially seem relatively simplistic, but there's a lot more complexity there as you start getting into it. Right. So the learning curve is, um, it's tapered just enough that you really start to delve into it. You don't feel like uh, you're getting overwhelmed right away, but there's enough there that you can keep playing for you know days, weeks, months, and still learn something new. Yeah, that first yeah, couple that, hours of experience is very curated. Mm-hmm. And they've done that. They've done that in World of Warcraft as well. I mean, that's a big, a big draw of early World of Warcraft was specifically that. Oh yeah, it was. It was the thing at the time. I mean, I, I mean, for me personally, I, I, it's, I'm a weird person with Blizzard. I, I play Hearthstone, Heroes of the Storm, and now Overwatch, and I don't really ever played the original ones. But exactly what you were saying is that it can be applied to all of them. You know, you you, you play. We'll stick with Overwatch as an example. You know, so you play a lot of Tracer. You know, playing a lot of Tracer, you, you get used to playing Tracer, you really enjoy Tracer, but you keep dying. You keep dying to characters like Bastion, who will just turn into a turret and mince me. You'll keep dying to Torbjorn, uh, you know, because you can't use your ult limb quick enough, you know, can't drop the sticky bomb. So you think, ah, oh, I really want to switch to a character that can beat them. So what character beats Bastion? Well, uh, Hanzo beats Bastion, so you switch to Bastion. Suddenly you're learning Bastion, mm-hmm. uh, learn how to fight against Bastion, and you're learning how to fight as Hanzo. And then, you know, with Hanzo, you're like, oh, I'm getting really annoyed with, like, people out mid-ranging me, so I'll switch to uh, some character with big health, like Roadhog, you know. So it, it, they, all of the characters kind of lead into each other quite nicely. Like, I found myself, when I was on attack, sometimes Tracer just was not good enough. Her low health pool uh, was an issue. Mm-hmm. So I switched to, uh, I looked at Reaper and went, well, this guy's, you know, up close. They've got a load of chunky people in the team. They've got a Winston running around. They've got a Roadhog running around. I'll switch to the guy with two shotguns and see how <laughs> that works. And suddenly, 
I'm learning Reaper, and I really enjoyed Reaper. It, it's yeah, it's so cool how they do that. And yeah. interestingly, you can switch mid game, and so it's actually possible for the meta of a single match to change pretty drastically as teams are kind of adapting to each other. I feel that was the point. Mm-hmm. And when I was playing, I felt it was the point. Like you know, you see a character you have a hard time dealing with, you switch to a character you're good with that can counter them. It it, it really the game doesn't hate you for staying as one character but it make, doesn't make your life easier yeah because that the team can just switch and destroy your choice yeah like actually blizzard um has has actually said that that is their intention because there were actually some people complaining about um i believe it was reaper it was one of the one of the uh, characters i think it was reaper saying oh they need to they need to nerf reaper it's too good and uh blizzard actually res- went out and responded to all these people saying look part of the game part of the game's mechanics is to switch characters as needed throughout the match. Hmm. So you're supposed to be doing that. And if a character seems like they're too good, then that's because you're all playing, you know, champions that are not matching up well against them. So you need to adapt your strategy. Yeah. It, I it, it, there I mean it took me a little while to get used to that. Um I, I remember when I started playing I picked up like a couple of characters. I played a couple of ones and stuck with the ones I enjoyed and there are times where I'm thinking, oh this character so I'm like um uh, May for me, I thought May was incredibly overpowered at one point. I was like, "Oh, she's really overpowered and really unbalanced." And then I just switched characters, and suddenly she became a joke. <laughs> you know, it sort of tw- it twigged like, "Oh, that's what my issue is." Uh, well, uh, don't get me wrong. I, uh, when I do say that, I, I do think there are one or two heroes who potentially actually are a bit too unbalanced, but that's mm-hmm. not necessarily the hero's fault. That's just sort of mechanic stuff. Like the aforementioned Bastion, like his turret mode, I. I don't know many turrets that can fire a minigun with the precision of a sniper rifle, but um, <laughs> I feel like, you know, because if, if you've played it for any amount of time in Overwatch, you'll know that when you see play of the game at Bastion, it's literally just a guy who's gone into, <laughs> into his bloody t- turret mode and just Stick held down the left mouse around. button. Yeah, mm. yeah it, it's, it's not fun, and it highlights an issue that, like, some issues with the game, especially when the play of the games are just a Bastion going, and then just murdering a bunch of people in a line it's a bit silly but uh, <laughs> overall though i i still was shocked that when i stopped playing it and i actually sat down and critically thought about overwatch that there was little to nothing that i could see or feel or think about that really made me not enjoy it like every second was joy the, the music the aesthetics the the voice acting all this other stuff as well was just great i like the way they did the the loot system with the loot boxes it was so cool it made every item you got to feel more special Oh, it was just, it was great. I'm, I'm wow. so thoroughly looking well, forward to playing Yeah, again. I mean, Blizzard, um, and again, I haven't had a chance to play much Overwatch at all, aside from a little bit. Um, but uh, Blizzard, for me, has always sort of excelled when it comes to loot acquisition and how they um, find ways to give you new equipment, new items, um, and character improvement through those items. So is it, when well, you're talking about uh, getting loot in Overwatch, are these things that you keep between matches? Because I honestly don't know. Yeah, you get like um, you get like uh, special different. You get different skins. You can mm-hmm. get different heroic poses, different taunts, uh, different sprays that you can use. Mm-hmm. Uh, you so these get, are these um, are non mechanical things, right? Then. It's all customization. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it's all customization. Okay. They, they said that they specifically said because you're paying uh, X amount of money to get the game, they would not put in stuff like as microtransactions to like help you win the game. So there's no mm-hmm. win more. They did nice. say that due to the popularity of like loot boxes, they might when the game comes out, implement a way to buy loot boxes so you can open up the boxes, kind of like packs, basically, mm, right. to get more stuff. Because you can get in-game currency as well that can be used to buy um, items specifically, but you can only get them from loot boxes. Um, so they said, we will sell loot boxes because it's all just, you know, just kind of, it doesn't affect the gameplay. You know, it just changes the way your character looks, which isn't exactly, you know, game-breaking or gives mm. you a cool, like, mm. end screen or something like that. Mm. But they did say that. They even said that if they added any more um, heroes to the game that they would be of no cost. They would just be added in, and then that's it. You know, the, and then they'll do the standard. Yeah, they hit, check out their new skins and check out their new things, which is super super cool. So I, I approve of that. It's a nice change from the whole sort of like, here's a new hero, pay another ten dollars. Like, uh, well, yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah. And speaking of opening packs, I think it's a good chance to segue into our uh, our Hearthstone talk. Um, and probably one of the most notable things about this new expansion, Whispers of the Old Gods, aside from all the new cards and the new theme and stuff like that, is the implementation of the standard mode. Uh, so now we have standard and wild, and wild is where you can do any card from any pack that's been released in the game. Um, but standard now is making it so it's always the classic, the basic cards, 
and then the most recent two years worth of content, which means that currently goblins versus gnomes is not part of the standard meta. Um, much to the chagrin, I'm sure, of um, aggro pallies. So sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Bradley, so far, what have you been thinking about um, Whispers of the Old Gods and uh, the standard mode? Have you been liking it? Have you been sticking to wild? Well, uh, as you know, I'm a huge card game fan. Um, I always have been. And I I was saying for years that Hearthstone couldn't continue with its just let's release a pack and have it. They couldn't do a Yu-Gi-Oh! For those who don't know, Yu-Gi-Oh, you can use any card from any set ever in existence in Yu-Gi-Oh. And while that's cool, it's fine because they have a ban list which bans cards out of production, which decks not really worthwhile, and then, then obviously they power creep the game. Yep. And they've been doing that for 20 years, and at the minute, Yu-Gi-Oh's in, a, in an absolute state. You know? And granted, yes, it's after 20 years, but Hearthstone is a, more, it's a very different game, and I've been saying for years that they're going to they're gonna bring in formats. It was, it was inevitable, mm. in my mind. And I had doubts about Standard at first. Like, I was like, eh, it might not be great. But after, I mean, I played it for like two, three days after the expansion happened. It was, it was a breath of fresh air. You had so much new uh, innovation happening with decks. You had so many more sort of interesting things going on. And then, that, then I even tried out Wild a little while. And Wild is exactly what you, you get on the tin. It's, it's crazy over there. Like, <laughs> even that has, like, tons of different decks doing absolutely insane things that you never thought was possible. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I, that, so as that... As a st- as Stan and a Wild go, I think they're great. I think they're only going to help the game over time. People were moaning about like how that they, they make cards irrelevant and for casual players it kind of sucks. But I I dis- highly disagree on that. I feel like if there were really lots of like people who want to hardcore play the game, then you just pick your format and stick with it. If you get the most fun out of getting Legend and Wild, go for Wild. If mm. you get the most, if you want to sort of go hardcore and standard, disenchant all your GVG stuff, disenchant all your uh, Naxxram stuff. And go haul all in on um, on uh, on the new stuff, you know. And then then when that stuff goes out of rotation, disenchant all of that and going on the new stuff, you know. Yes, you're losing dust, but you're still playing and getting stuff at the time. So I had no issue with it. Like a lot of people were moaning, but I haven't sunk that much money into Hearthstone. I've bought the occasional pack here and there. I've bought all the um, single player like expansion things. So I bought Nax Ramus, Black Rock Mounting, and League of Explorers. But they're only like fifteen pounds over here, which is like what maybe like twelve dollars or something like that. So it's like it's not that big of a deal really if you're playing the game for hours as much as I do so I don't know I, I think it's great it actually didn't occur to me the idea of just disenchanting all the stuff that's not in standard anymore I might have to look into that yeah I'm not <laughs> sure I'd be willing to do it I'm too much of a collector mm. me to, I mean to be fair I had issues with it at first like I, I sort of looked and was like uh, I, will I, I kind of looked at cards and evaluated them like I was like will this card ever really sort of be useful again like in a tavern brawl or like a um, or like a sort of a wild format and I just got rid of everything that was kind of eh you know, like I was kind of so I like, got loads of loads of common cards, loads of rare cards, a couple of epic sense. cards that I had laying around here and there, and I kept stuff that I knew would be good. Like Muster for Battle is a Paladin card that will probably be good in some wild or format or tavern brawl soon, so I kept that. Mm-hmm. Um, things things like that I kept a hold of because I knew they'd be potentially viable. A couple of legendaries I got rid of as well, and things like that. It, it's one of those things. It's like you know, you, you sort of have to make the mind up about what happens. And um, you know, I bet a lot of people got rid of um, a card called Me- Metal Tooth Leaper for Hunter. It's a it's a card that buffs all mechs by plus two when it comes uh, when it hits the board, and then in this tavern rule that's recently just happened, Mech Tooth Leaper is one of the best decks in the thing. So loads of people were scrambling to re-enchant that. <laughs> I know I was. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh wow, that's a really good combo. So there'll be occasions like that, but I feel overall it'll be fine. I feel like there's not really uh, that he sort of as long as you're careful with it, you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. And uh, just real quick before we wrap this segment, favorite old god. Ooh. Um, I think Nazoth. I, lo- I love the the decks that Nazoth has created. And Nazoth to bring back all Death Rattle stuff is is just super fun to drop in late game. Cthulhu, I feel is very um, it's very limiting to design because you can only really make when you build, put Cthulhu in a deck, you can only build a Cthulhu deck, and that's mm-hmm. kind of um, Yog Saron is is fun, but, but not, it's kind of like I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to play a card that loses me the game mm-hmm. single handedly. Um, and Yasharaj is just again it's very it's very singular it has one use and that's kind of it it's like i play it and then hope i get a good card and it's like eh. i mean they all have their decks and stuff but i feel like overall nazoth is the most interesting and most sort of useful and fun card I mean, there's nothing like playing nazoth and then suddenly getting like sylvanas calm bloodhooth mm-hmm. all that other cool stuff back in one big go and going now how'd you get past this <laughs> yeah <laughs> very cool one quick thing about Blizzard before we wrap it up is they've always been really, really good at balance. Mm-hmm. And so 
Um, I think that as long as they respect their brand by continuing to do that kind of a balance, making the decisions like they have in uh, in Hearthstone and also in Overwatch, I think uh, we'll see a lot more good stuff coming from them. I, I think, and I will say this, I think what makes Blizzard good at balance is that, I, I would, I'll put it this way, I think they're, they're best at appeasing the fan base long enough. Um, so what they'll do is, something will be unbalanced. So they'll kind of flip it so that now someone some class that was a little too weak is now the strongest one for a while. Mm. And they'll go around and they'll appeal, because this is what they did in World of Warcraft for years. Yeah. World of Warcraft was never perfectly balanced, mm. and it's still not, it still isn't. It, it's impossible. <laughs> but what they do is, they they come, they come get this reputation for, being, for having great balance because they keep changing things so that you can't just stick with one class and this is always going to be the best class. Mm-hmm. Everything's always switching around. So they're, they're, they're very flexible in that way. So I agree with you, but I agree with you in the sense of more, uh, they're very good at appeasing their fan base. I'll say. <laughs> I would, and I would say, and that's, that's not true. a knock on them either. But the the <laughs> trick is to make sure that you just always value the lessons of rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock. Yes. <laughs> for that, you know that that is the ultimate of game design. And dynamite, dynamite beats all of them. That's how I play. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with, yeah. the, with, with that. Just variant. hold up the one finger, dynamite. You know, it's like uh, dynamite blows up, blows up, blows right through rock. You know, goes straight straight through paper. <laughs> And don't forget the middle finger, which is basically just choosing not to play the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Labels. That's, that's, the, that's the universal out right there. Yeah, but no, you so. are right. Blizzard do, do do a big thing of appeasing. I mean, in, uh, look at Hearthstone, for example. Um, before the expansion, if you'd sold someone that uh, Shaman were going to be the best deck in every single way, someone you would have laughed in your face, and the expansion <laughs> comes out. Suddenly, it's the best deck of the whole format. And you're like, yeah. what? Yeah. What happened but then, here? But then someone's going to encounter that strategy. It's on their head. Oh yeah, and it's and that's and that's not going to last either. So it's just people will will flock over to what they perceive as the most powerful for a while, and there'll be other people that will do the exact opposite as a challenge, and then it'll completely change. And now there'll be like a whole rush to go another direction. It actually keeps people more active and encourages people to play different classes, different characters. Um, it, it's actually great for the game's longevity. And speaking of the meta game, this is the gaming meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. When I was cleaning out my room in my parents' house, I found this old Nintendo strategy guide called the Ultimate Unauthorized Nintendo Exclamation Point Game Strategies. This is from uh, 1989. Unauthorized. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Unauthorized, but ultimate. That was and, great. <laughs> yes, and the reason I bring this up, it's actually pretty pretty interesting because even on the back it talks about you can get the latest info on um, the future technology like the Game Boy or the U-Force or the Power Glove. Oh, I'm looking forward to the Power Glove. Yeah. <laughs> I hear that thing is so bad. <laughs> oh, it's so bad. It's so bad. It, it really was. <laughs> so, so we've got these, uh, um, what I thought was interesting about this book was that we, we, we're so accustomed now to uh, video game genres like uh, the action-adventure, the platformer, uh, the, the role-playing game. Well, back in 89, they weren't necessarily as well-established and uh, as um, ubiquitous, <laughs> I should say, as they are now, uh, because games were still in a very experimental phase. So in this book, they actually still have game categories. They don't even call them genres. But the way, maybe because that's a little bit of a big word for a kid, I don't know. Um, but the these uh, categories are actually divided in a pretty interesting way, and I kind of wanted to maybe read some of these, talk about them a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go down the list, and you guys just throw out uh, some games that you think might fit these categories. So the first one, Aliens and Monsters. Do you Galaga. Uh, it aliens and Monsters? Wouldn't, but yeah, Aliens and Monsters is the first category for video games. So let me give you some <laughs> ideas. I'll just go through. So like uh, an idea, for example, like Friday the Friday the Thirteenth. If you remember playing that, he was an alien that explains so much. For some reason, that's an alien. <laughs> he's a monster. Mm-hmm. Uh, they even list a game like, for example, Mega Man Two. There's no aliens or monsters in that. It's robots. Um, but okay. Oh, okay. Um, Fester's Quest. If you remember playing that game on the NES. Oh, now I'm just offended. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then we have this this next category, Amazing Quests, and this one's pretty obvious. Well, like Legend of Zelda? Right. Okay. So that's a pretty obvious one. But they their example is actually um, Rescue Princess Shaharazad. So I'm not even sure what game that's wow. from, to be honest with you. Um, then, they have Car- then they have Car Wars. It's pretty obvious. Uh, they have this category called Flying Feet, which I'm assuming what? is... Yeah, I'm assuming it's beat-em-up games. What, like Kid Icarus? 
Is like I was going to say like something like Sonic like, the Hedgehog or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Double E-T? Maybe so. I'm not exactly sure because they don't even give me an example of a flying feet game. Like I don't even have an example listed here. A so flying I don't feet e- game. Yeah, and I'm assuming it's uh, it's probably something like Double Dragon would make sense oh, for, of course. for for flying feet. Here we go. I found one in here. Fist of the North Star. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. There uh, we go. Okay. So we're talking right. like martial arts games, like kung fu or something. Um, what are flying fists then? Come I, on, guys. I don't know. Maybe because the the kick was more popular. I well, actually, know. there's a picture here. <laughs> I don't know if you can see, of like uh, a little foot with wings on it. Like the Mercury? Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, okay, so then we have Fun Learning. Those are, of course, just learning games. That's Mavis uh, Bacon right there. Yes. <laughs> and a category called Gym Bag. Like, instead of calling it sports, they just call the category Gym Bag. <laughs> gym um, Bag? Yes. That's crazy. Gym Bag. That's absolutely crazy. Okay, this just kind of reeks of somebody who wanted to... <laughs> Like put their stamp on that. <laughs> be, be, like, be clever. I, I came up with with all the For genres, Bag, yeah. all the genres. That was me, and <laughs> and we just kind of went. No, it doesn't make any sense. Well, <laughs> we'll get this. So the so the category for for Super Mario Brothers um, is there's this category called just for laughs. Which <laughs> it's apparently just like it includes tons of games, and they just say. Um, their description is, of course, we've got Mario and Luigi in here, as though, like, you're supposed to go, oh, yeah, of course, just for laughs, obviously Mario. <laughs> and it says, you'll also meet Master Higgins, Mappy and Mappico, Mickey and Minnie, and Dino Ricky. <laughs> Most of those characters did not quite survive as, as, as quite the legends that Mario and Luigi became. <laughs> um, and then we it's, have this It sounds other category. like it was a hundred years ago. Yeah, it, it like really it does. Really, like, it really does. Like old it sounds games. like It's crazy. I, I'm j- actually a little bit, like, shocked. <laughs> that's uh, that's at their actual descriptions used. Well, okay, so there's there's a couple more categories here. So we have Lost in the Maze, which is obviously things like Pac-Man or Bubble Bobble, uh, Marble Madness. These are game. These are this is actually a game uh, category that we don't really see very much of in modern games. Uh, and then we have Shoot 'em Ups, which is the only one that actually fits with modern game classifications. And that's where something like Galaga would go in. Mm-hmm. Um, and then strategies and simulations, which I guess also kind of fits. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of overlap, but what I find interesting here is that the games are being classified almost... It's almost more like from, uh, like, thematically, not so much mechanically. Yeah. And so, and today we tend to classify... Genres sort of a mechanic. mixture. It's sort of mechanically, but then there's also that element of... Um, you know what are you doing in the game mm-hmm. kind of aspect the verb as well right right so a lot a lot of like you know action type classifications where these seem to be more thematic mm-hmm. classifications do you think that there's value in the, in classifying games in this sense well what's all? interesting is that you mentioned um, one of the last ones was uh, strategy and simulation which is actually an established genre in tabletop yes it was basically being adapted yeah. to video games um, and so I think in a way it was kind of this sort of, to me, reflects a time when video games were kind of more toys, and the activities were primarily reflecting some real-life experience yeah. that we have. Like the gym bag. You know, I'm going to go play sports, I'm going to grab my gym bag, and I'm going to go play sports with the guys. But there were also lots of games during this period that were completely not like a real experience. Oh, sure. Um, you know, like Ghosts and Goblins. You know, I, don't, I don't usually run around in my underwear throwing mm-hmm. javelins at zombies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, in that was... case, though, then, like, you know, Monsters and Aliens. And you clearly haven't lived. To... Yeah, that's true, right. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I need to do that. I need to get right on that. Monsters and Aliens seems we are comparing it to film genres. Um, it and, does, and, and it actually you know, kind of mixes in, like, I mean, horror just kind of got grouped in there along yeah. with things like, you know, action games like Mega Man 2. Mm-hmm. I think what's interesting is that they didn't try to do film genres at all. Yeah, completely divorced from film. Yeah, has so. zero connection any of these to film genres, which mm-hmm. I thought was actually interesting. It is. It is. You're right. I mean, I would have expected it to try and tie into film almost. I mean, I feel like. Uh, to be fair, actually, you know, I tell I tell a lie. I think around that time, games were sort of sort of becoming their own thing. I mean, it was. Uh, was it, it was eighty nine? That right? Nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, this is book? from nineteen eighty nine. Yeah. Yeah, it was about that time they were starting to be like a, a new thing, especially for. Because it was around that time it started being marketed as a toy rather than a electronical good. Well, and, um, and Nintendo so. actually, to be fair, Nintendo had to do that when they came out with the uh, entertainment system, the NES. Yeah. Because uh, they weren't able to sell it in stores as a video game console because the video games became sort of like a, a negative word after the video game crash here. So they had yeah. to market them as toys. It, like it's this is not Nintendo video game system. This is Nintendo entertainment system. So you can put it with the toys. 
it, like along with sitting it next to like a Cabbage Patch doll or something. Robbie the Robot. Right. Or Ro- like, yeah. Then they had Rob- they packaged it with like Robbie the Robot, so it looked more like a toy. So some of that was was marketing too. I think that video games, to be fair, had been established for a while, especially in the arcades, going back to the seventies, big time in the seventies. A little bit before that too, obviously. So there was some precedent there, but uh, you're right. There was a lot of like experimentation and maturity that I think came out of this early period of in this, uh, you know, the mid to late 90s. There was a lot of growth, very rapid growth that I think that the medium did do. And a lot of that was because so many people had these games um, at home, but also because they were able to have such like bigger experiences than what you could get at an arcade. In an arcade, you're only going to be expected to play for a limited time. Um, when you had a home console system like the NES that that gave you these long experiences, you could have games like Legend of Zelda or Metroid that would have never worked on an arcade. Mm-hmm. Because you can't sit there and play yeah. for that long. To, you'd never be able to beat Legend of Zelda sitting at an arcade unless you just, like, you know, stood there for, like, 32 hours or something. You know, there was a very Which probably some people short may have period done. of time <laughs> where they tried to do that, where you could bring your save cartridge mm-hmm. with you and you could continue where you left off in the arcade. Oh yeah, yeah. Very brief period of time it was in the early nineties. Did not did not go well. Well, and I've they still do that sometimes though. Like in some arcade games, you can sort of uh, enter in like a, a passcode, especially yes, for you, or like true. get like a a card that you can actually insert into the machine, and it would sort of save your data. Yeah, they didn't really. I don't think they did very well. I mean, I've very rarely see them around. But yeah, still, um, it's it's not common out. anymore. But you're you're absolutely right, and I remember doing that. Not so much the, uh, the little save card that you're talking about, but um, the the passcodes. Like you really could get. Uh, you'd go a certain distance in the game, and then at the end they'd give you a passcode, and it was kind of like these old games that we had on the NES before we had batteries, yeah. um, where they would just give you a password, and you could just use that password to always start where you left off. Something that we don't really do much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, yeah. that would be really easy to do, because you whip out your phone, you take a picture of it. That's true, they could give you a QR code. Yeah. As opposed to a password, That's right? Good point. Hmm. The uh, F Zero uh, arcade machine, um, when the GameCube version came out, actually had a thing where you can plug in your GameCube memory card. Um, and you would either have new cars unlocked in the arcade, or the arcade would unlock new cars or tracks in your game. Oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Rem- I yeah. remember hearing about that. I oh, know that's, so, that's, that's so really cool. cool. Mm. F Zero is really Man, cool, I love actually, the game on GameCube. We need a new F Zero. It's been way too long. I think so too. <laughs> um, Cross fingers for the NX. Yeah, there that you would go. be pretty cool. I, I would definitely get wrecked though because I was never that good at F Zero. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty bad. topic of discussion. Okay, so I think we're, we're ready to move on to our uh, media discussion today, um, where we're going to talk about uh, the differences between different, uh, you know, Western, Western nations and their sort of strategies towards game development and game design. Um, Bradley, do you want to kind of take us into this? This is kind of like your wheelhouse? Yeah, sure. So, um, for a long, long time, um, a lot of the uh, public perceptions of game design and sort of games is that they they were predominantly split into two camps of uh, Western and Eastern. What's hilarious to me is that after studying this for so long, is that no one, an academic or anyone in the industry, has ever really bothered to define them. You know, so you know, you you see E three and E three be like, we've got our most prominent Western developers. You know, look at this Western development company making this Western game. When we got these Eastern developers, blah blah blah, and they met reference it all the time, but there's no real sort of precedent for it. Um, and because of that, happening, all, harking all the way back to when you know it, it was when the NES came out, um, you know, that that split has made like been there the entire mm-hmm. time. You know, there's never been anything different. But when you actually look at the split, like I mentioned earlier, it's literally just Eastern is defined as like the Asian countries, so like you know Japan, China, you know that sort of stuff, and everywhere else in the world is considered Western. Yeah, you can make a game in <laughs> Russia and a game in Mexico, both considered Western developers. It's it's crazy, and I thought this was absolutely mental uh, when I was in university and I was studying. Um, I remember I went to a, a conference in Crete. Uh, the Foundation of Digital Games Conference to publish a paper. Um, I'd done a, a, a reward system uh, uh, like diagram that could be utilized on game design documents for ease of understanding uh, how your game's going to sort of go in terms of its reward systems and how it will be, uh, how it's going to hit certain te- target demographics of players and stuff like that. So I was out there and I was talk- giving the talk, and um, 
people ask me naturally to give examples of this triangle. So me being from Britain, I used a lot of uh, British games that I knew had been made. So it was like you know, um, you know, I was going the Fable series. That was the one I used a lot, mm-hmm. like because uh, everyone knew the Fable at the time. It was one of the games that was recently come out. Um, so I was using the Fable, and I noticed, like offhand, that the triangle was not consistent with how I'd looked at American games like made from American developers. And it started, started to reveal to me that, you know, there might actually be a further split in Western game design, um, which, are, are, you know, sorry. Bradley, are you, are you implying that British culture and American culture has differences? I, I might be. Oh, <laughs> I know. It's, I know it's shocking. I don't, I don't see that at all. <laughs> I mean, Grand Theft Auto was made in America, right? Rock, Rockstar's an American studio. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Rockstar's an American studio. They're as American as they come. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotta be. Well, that's actually an interesting point. Actually, the, point, the truth it? is that Rock, Rockstar, to be fair, Rockstar is actually, um, the parent company is based in America, actually mm-hmm. in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. uh, Grand Theft Auto, of course, uh, is why we're laughing, is um, actually designed by Rockstar North, which is located in Scotland. Yeah. Really? I thought they were in London. No, no, they're in Scotland. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. They do yeah. have a branch in London. Um, yes, they do. But it, okay. they Maybe sort of do other of. things, but... Well, again, you, you bring up a good example there. Like uh, people always, you know, it was funny to me because um, when I was studying this, obviously, and doing this stuff for PhD, GTA Five came out, and I, I loved sort of seeing the reception of it from the different sections that I'd sort of looked at in my PhD. Like, so I saw like America being like, "Aha! Look, this is a really funny like example of how American life is, and ha, it's funny." And look at, and Europeans going, "Ha Look how stupid America is!" <laughs> it was it was so funny, like how to see this sort of split because it was online and forums as well like some people would be like um oh you know i love how it makes fun of american culture and then like mm-hmm. people would be like how does it make fun of our culture i thought it's just sort of showing the worst end of it it's like no no it's definitely making fun of you and it's like <laughs> and there was these big arguments like and then you've got like these um like uh, eastern developers being like oh, isn't the west stupid <laughs> <laughs> that's literally what it was like in, 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 in japan specifically they were just playing the game and they were like this is exactly what westerns are like I mean, I frequently walk into a Westerner's bathroom and find a body in it. <laughs> I find, you know, nice. frequently there's a there's a guy trying to flush a hand down a toilet. I mean, that's just how it that's, is, isn't it? That's what I that's but, what I love so much about Grand Theft Auto is it really is actually a very clever satire of American culture, and uh, of course uh, it it plays it it plays it up to the point where um, you're completely willing to laugh at yourself because it does it so well. Um, so one thing that, that I just to kind of take this in this direction of maybe trends between different nations, because one of the things that I noticed when I was putting together my list of um, some of the more prominent game developers from Europe um, was just kind of this connection with British developers, um, like you already mentioned, um, Fable, um, also obviously Grand Theft Auto from Rockstar North. So do you think, and then another one that I had here was uh, Traveler's Tales, who makes the Lego games. Do you think mm-hmm. that, um, since I know you've, I, I know you've done a lot more research on this than me. Do you think that British game developers um, tend to have more of a uh, sort of like sense of humor, or maybe maybe that's not the right word, maybe wit is, is a better term for it uh, when it comes yeah. to developing games? Let's not forget rare in that category. Yes, and rare is... Yeah, but yes. rare, true, yeah. This is, you've kind of touched on one of the things that I... What, this was one of the first things I, I determined when I did, was doing a bit of testing around. I, I spoke to a lot of my peers who are in varying sort of uh, different positions in companies. I've got people in Codemasters, Jadex, all those sort of big companies in the UK. And I was asking them, like, you know, questions, specific questions. Not like leading questions, but questions to sort of get an idea um, about how they sort of... how their company sort of treats games. And the first thing that came back almost every single time for every company, and, and a lot of places in Europe as well, to note but predominantly in britain was humor mm. we the humor in our games is very prominent like not to say other games can't be funny but comedy is comedy and humor in games is so difficult to do because comedy and and like jokes making and stuff like that and, and any form of humor is based on timing mm. and in a in a film or a tv show you set your own timing you know, you, you wait for the, you pause for the jokes, you know, you, you, you know when there'll be a laugh and things like that. Whereas in games, the player dictates the timing. Hmm. Right. So mm-hmm. it's so if you've, you've got this skewed thing where you've got to sort of try and try really hard to do something that's either inherently funny or subtly honey, honey, <laughs> subtly, <laughs> yes, subtly funny. Um, so, you know, this is something that Fable did really well. Fable sort of uh, put you in positions where you 
were it, the moment you were in was completely ludicrous and you would be forced to react to it and depending on how you the player reacted to it um generated the humor so when you're told that you can kick a chicken and then you kick the chicken and you get an achievement for kicking the chicken some people would just be like oh just uh -huh, cool i've got an achievement some people are like i just kicked a chicken and it gave me an achievement what the hell <laughs> and then some people will kick the chicken even more and then they get another achievement for kicking the chicken and it's like little things like that um that do i mean you can see it, as you mentioned before traveler's tales making the uh the lego game series if you've ever played a lego game oh. they love to take the absolute mick out of their characters yeah it's mm -hmm. so so funny and it's so and it's subtly funny as well. It's in their little bits of their design and, and things like that. And it, it's just, it's so interesting to see. And it's something that's not, you don't normally tend to see from uh, uh, like sort of American made games. Is that there are, there is humor in places and there are definitely funny, funny moments. But I find that a lot of European stuff tends to have a lot more humor in, embedded in it. And whether that's a good thing or not is debatable or whether it's like a a, a benefit even is, is debatable too but it is a, a for me personally a big highlight of how there is that difference you know it, it's 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 i can't even it's so hard to explain like i mean you, we i assume everyone here has played fa the fable series in some oh, yeah. way mm -hmm. a little yeah. bit yeah yeah you know like they deliberately hire <laughs> hired comedians to play roles and you know they're not even to make jokes. I mean, John Cleese was your butler in yeah. Fable Three, yeah. mm -hmm. and he he had a lot of sarky comments, but he wasn't doing comedy. It was just the sarcastic nature of him and his presence as he followed you around that was made amusing. Whereas you know uh, you've got like say um, an Alfred kind of character in like a Batman game, and Alfred will make like snarky remarks that are supposed to be laughed at. If that makes sense. So you can sort of feel like it's almost written to be funny rather than implied to be funny. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's actually the point I was, I was going to make, too, um, was basically to say a lot of times American games that are meant to be humor um, sort of make it a lot more overt. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily saying that that's, again, that's not necessarily saying that's a bad thing or a good thing. It's just they present the humor in such a way where, okay, this is meant to be a funny game. I'm looking at something like, uh, say, the Space Quest series or Leisure Suit Larry or something like um, Monkey Island these, these games are specifically, okay, now you're in a funny moment, here's a joke. Uh, whereas games like Fable or Grand Theft Auto, a lot of times will put you in a situation that is presented straight, but it's a ridiculous situation, and therefore it's funny. Mm -hmm. So, and GTA, I think, is actually the, the master, Rockstar North, rather, is kind of the master of that sort of tack, where you're in this situation, it really should be serious, uh, you, you could die, you're being shot at or something, but... Um, the way that it's presented to you is just absurd. And the GTA V, for example, Trevor's whole character was kind of built around that. It's this very, very much a um, alpha male, um, very kind of very dangerous, psychotic character. But at the same time, he's hilarious because he's presented in such an over the top way. Yeah, but he's it, not it's, telling it's, jokes. <laughs> no, no, yeah, there's something. It's <laughs> Never. Like, like, <laughs> Like, I love the fact that whenever you switch to him, because obviously in GTA you can switch from all the characters, yeah. you switch with him, and he's just in a bin. <laughs> yeah, wearing a dress and sometimes. And he's just in a bin wearing a dress, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. and there's no joke to be made there. He's just in a bin. <laughs> and, and, and I found that hysterical whenever I like used to switch to him. I was like, he's, he's just going out of a, a giant bin. What the bloody hell is he doing? Whereas <laughs> I, the, I know like in the reviews they were just like, why, why is he in a bin? <laughs> like, I, I thought it was like, excellent why? too I, I, no I'm with you I thought it was hilarious and I, I, a lot of times I would switch to Trevor just to kind of see where he was and what he was doing because <laughs> a lot of times it's, I mean it, he, he could just be sometimes he'd be out in the middle of nowhere on like a beach and you're like where the hell am I he just wakes up on a beach somewhere like drunk <laughs> you have no idea where it, he's going to be It's it, he was the most fun character to switch to oh god yeah like it was it was one of those things it's like um it, it's it's just it's so hard it's really difficult i've been studying this for a long time and it's even difficult for me to accurately sort of talk about because it's it's difficult to sort of, as i said humor is difficult in general so to yeah. describe humor is even more difficult because you're sort of going like you know you can only really sort of reference moments you know you've got games like uh like manhunt you know manhunt is is a is a very infamous game mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons but I know so a lot of people in Europe find that game absolutely hilarious because it's yeah. just it's it's so ridiculous. Yeah, it's, no, I, yes, you are exactly graphically killing about, people, yeah. but it's it's ridiculous and people found it hilarious. But in America, obviously, it was it was the Antichrist. You know, I, it was like and I, and I think it was that horrendous. Was more, it, it it kind of got that reputation more from 
uh, people in the media that didn't necessarily even play much of the game. They just kind of wanted to create that kind of moral panic. Um, mm. I think the title played a, a and big the, part the in the title show. did too, but I, I do think that people that actually played the game, I don't believe, had that same sort of reaction. At least not the... Like oh no this game is this game is super evil I'm not necessarily saying everyone liked it because it was definitely a, a divisive game and uh, from what I understand even you know even in um, in Britain and other parts of Europe it wasn't exactly you know a, a top seller it was not a hugely popular game it definitely had sort of had to find its own niche it wasn't like a Grand Theft definitely, Auto yeah um, but still um, I I wouldn't necessarily say that the reaction that the American press had towards the game is necessarily the reaction that American gamers had towards it. Yeah, I mean the the problem is is with when you get a, a game that gets as big as something like that is it the, it does have a sort of a social so, oh my god I can't speak this evening <laughs> social perception to it um, like games will sort of uh, get a, uh, a notoriety based on the general populace's idea regardless of that's true anything yeah. around them which which kind of sucks because it has killed games that are potentially good mm-hmm. um, and because the general is I don't like it suddenly it becomes oh well I shouldn't like it and I feel like that's kind of what happened to a lot of games like that like they sort of went well I shouldn't like this game um, so I will go into it with an ideal of like, oh, it probably won't be good, and then you, you won't be, it won't tickle your boxes, so you'll just discard it as being meh. I, you know, I think that's that was a that's a very disappointing thing that happens quite frequently. I think that's what happened with um, uh, another Rockstar game, Bully. Um, it was sort of treated, it was presented in the media as, oh, this is this this is a uh, bully simulator where you're going to learn how to be a horrible bully to people. Which, of course, the game was the exact opposite. You were actually trying to unite all the factions, and you were sort of this. Um, actually, even though you were a, a troubled kid, you were also, um, you know, a virtuous character actually trying to help other people in the school, and you were sticking up for kids that were bullied. Uh, but because of the title and because it was coming from Rockstar that was known for GTA, they just assumed you were going to A, bully kids in school, and B, kill kill kids. Neither of yeah. which was the case. So, yeah, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. And I think that actually hurt, I think, the sales of that game, because it's, despite coming from Rockstar, it's actually didn't really get the same sort of um, attention or mainstream success that Grand Theft Auto did. I think you made an interesting... I, I love the Bully series. Oh, no, no, no. I, it's a fantastic game. It's actually, it's one of my favorites. I, I love that game. But yeah, it's, it's just unfortunate that it sort of hit that, um, kind of came up against the, the media perception. Um, so not to talk too much about Britain, although it is, it is very interesting, but I did <laughs> want to touch a little bit on some of these other developers from, from different parts of Europe, because when I was putting my list together and looking at um, developers from kind of the um, like Eastern Europe up into Scandinavia kind of regions. I was noticing uh, games were, uh, I guess maybe maybe bleak, darker is maybe a term that that I don't know if you if you kind of got the same impression. Um, some of these examples are uh, Metro, Stalker, uh, The Witcher. Um, yeah, Max Payne. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's it's, it's it's funny when you um, start to go outwards into other places of Europe you find a lot of their games have been in some way really heavily influenced by their culture mm, and their yeah. sort of um, like sort of uh, their history almost and again this isn't to say that other countries don't do this but it's almost like these countries have gone well we let's draw on the thing that we know we have which is our history and our culture I mean you look at The Witcher for example The Witcher 3 uh, I assume most of you've played The Witcher 3 oh, I the Witcher absolutely 3, love it fantastic yeah. game which three is a great game and it's so soaked in law i mean mm-hmm. cd project red um is a, well they again i believe they're polish aren't they polish. oh my god yes they're polish forgotten this mm-hmm. yeah yeah they're polish and if you go into like a little bit of polish history and culture and, and like folklore almost you you see little dabs of what was in the witcher and that's really nice because it gives their game a sort of extra essence to it. So you can look at it as just like a really amazing role-playing game. But if you go deeper and start reading the books and start getting into the lore, looking at the sort of the, the, the lore, the folklore, and the mythology behind the world, you get an idea of what Polish culture is almost like a little bit as well yeah. and how their folklore was, which is something that happens um, across Europe. And, and unfortunately... A lot of history is quite dark. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's so true. The games do um, get a little bit darker. Like uh, it, it, it's 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 almost to be expected in my mind. It's like when you sort of get games like from there. I mean, obviously we know the legacy of good old Max Payne. 
Yeah. I mean, bl- bless his little heart. That guy can't get a damn break, can he? <laughs> <So> <laughs> and, he and it's like, uh, it's, it's a thing. And it's funny because it, they're, they're a Finnish developer, if I remember correctly. That's correct, uh, yes. Remedy, yeah. Remedy Entertainment. Yeah. They're, they're, they're a Finnish... And, you know, their they're sort of thing, they're very... Um, they've been very sort of there with like you know they're quite next to Russia and things like that and they've had a lot of um, a weird stuff going up there especially that being close to the, that close to Russia and all that sort of mm-hmm. thing and, and, sort and of they the did thing. they did Alan Wake as well they kind of have this history with sort of like the noir kind of like a noir style game where it sort of takes mm-hmm. that those sort of like um, uh, themes from noir films in America and just kind of ran with it yeah it's 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 so fascinating to look look at these games and sort of see parts of their companies like in themselves. It's great. I mean, um, I've just got it up here because I, I couldn't remember the name of the game for the life of me. But the first game uh, Remedy made was a game called uh, Death Rally, <laughs> <laughs> which was actually uh, the name kind of implies you know what it's about. I mean, it had a picture of uh, a Duke Nukem on the front of it. Mm. If that <laughs> wasn't to ram it, it home. I haven't been played. Is that like a death race kind of thing? Um, yeah, it's pretty much what you were going to say. So it, it describes itself as a top-down perspective vehicular combat racing ah, video game, it's like Spy Hunter. Yeah, or like uh, yeah, stuff like that. It, it's it's kind of that. So you can sort of see where they they came from in that. Even then, and the next thing they made was obviously Max Payne, and they've obviously gone off with that. Um, and then obviously Quantum Break is mm-hmm. their newest one. Um, even that, you know, that's sort of got the grittiness to it, and the sort of, uh, and also because of Finland, Finland and Sweden um, are quite big in terms of like uh, games and sort of academic stuff to do with games. And Quantum Break has a lot of that in it as well, um, which is which is interesting to see. Although Quantum Break apparently hasn't done that well, uh, as far as I've been aware, <laughs> I haven't actually played it yet. It's it's on my to get list, but. No, I haven't. Um, I haven't played it either. It's got, um, from what I've seen though, from the images, it's got really beautiful graphics. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's been t- apparently it's it's like a, a like a, a f- like a TV show, sort of like The Wire and a game at the same time. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, I, 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 I can't really comment on it because I haven't played it. But it's it's kind of like oh, it's, it's so it's so interesting to me to see these games because when you when you've been doing it for as long as I have, and you start applying like different methods to look at their methodology of creation and like their reward systems. Even it's it's so cool to see these links between their culture and not and um, yeah, I, I just it's so it, it's 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 almost like they're sort of giving you a window into their sort of life, mm-hmm. which is great. And again, this isn't to say that uh, American developers or other Western developers don't do this, but I feel like. Europe tend to do it more. I don't know whether it's like a, a like uh, an inherent inag- inadequacy they feel they have. Like it's like oh we're not we're not as big as the Americas and we're not as like critically acclaimed and saviors as the Japanese. So we've got to sort of have a different thing. But mm. it, it it just feels like that's it. Almost is like they do it deliberately. Almost like they, every single product they make is like deliberately done to sort of try and go oh look at this cool extra thing. I mean look again look back to The Witcher. The Witcher was just like they were like right. We've done The Witcher 2. Witcher 3 will come out when it's perfect. And you, that's, that's it. That's happening. And it will come out when it's absolutely perfect and yeah. reach that pinnacle. And they, they didn't release it for, for yonks. And then all of a sudden it comes out. And yes, it was this huge... And it was... Well, it yeah, is, sorry. They're, they're doing the same thing with uh, their new game, uh, Cyberpunk 2077, which was yeah. announced back in 2012. And you know, it, was, it excited me when it was first announced. And I, I, you know, desperately want it to come out, and I'm glad that they confirmed they're still working on it. But it's the same sort of situation where they're going to release it when they feel it's perfect. They're not going to release it a day before. Yeah. That is something I find um, European developers do a lot more as well. Is that they they are very flexible with their release dates. That they are one of those people who are of the approach of it will come out when it's done. Um, I, I don't know whether that again is like a is like a kickback from not wanting to be like everywhere else, but they are very much sort of like. You know, stop asking us questions. It, it will be done when it's done. <laughs> and I wonder it's, if I wonder if part of that is um, just kind of the differences in the industry, because you tend to notice that the games that come out rushed are the ones that tend to be part of like big publishing conglomerates, things like you know Ubisoft, which does have you know European roots, um, oh, it's, or yeah, it's, all, it's French, um, you know, in the US French, Activision yeah. and um, EA and stuff like that. These big publishers who are basically almost like movie studios in a sense. 
where they're mm. just trying to crank out games after games after games after games, and then the occasional hit is kind of making up for the losses incurred on all the lesser releases. Um, but my impression is that with a lot of European developers, they tend to be a little bit more independent in the sense that, like, you know, they're perhaps large, perhaps mid-sized, perhaps small, but they're not a part of some, like, giant parent uh, corporation. Yeah, I think you nailed it. I think you're, you're yeah. totally right. I mean, CG, CD Projekt Red, I don't think is like a, it's not a tiny company, but it's certainly not, it not, doesn't have the sort of clout that, say, um, you know, Activision Blizzard has, where they're this, like, you know, billion-dollar company that can afford to release a game that is a dud every once in a while. They can't do that. They have to, every game they release has to make the money. Mm-hmm. And, you know, notably, Blizzard's an example of a U.S. developer who, especially before the merger, like, they were notorious for pushing back release dates over and over and over again. Um, but that also gave them the reputation as having really quality games every time they did come out. Mm-hmm. It's almost like, as well, something that I, I think I should mention as well, is that a lot of um, developers over in Europe as well will try... It's almost like a sort of like a badge of honor when you make a game and it's just assumed that it was made in America. Like a, a game. No, you, you. I mean, it sounds funny, but like if you think about it, like, have you have any of you played um, Until Dawn? Uh, no, no, I, ha- no, I have not. I've heard it's okay. pretty good, but I haven't had well, you, a chance to you, play. You know it. the gist of it. It's like a super yes. hyper realistic horror thing full of like tropes. Um, that's made in the UK, mm-hmm. and and a lot of people because it's so filled with like American horror story tropes and. Uh, obviously a cast of fully American kids and characters, a lot of people would thought it was made by an American company. And they took that as a they took it as a compliment. They're like, oh well we've yeah, done our job then. Like if we've we've accurately portrayed a bunch of um, stupid American kids in a Scooby Doo esque style murder story, <laughs> then yeah, we've done our job. Great. There you go, it's cool. But it, it's things like that as well. Like it's a lot of times like you know, Rockstar obviously are big people. There's like a lot of I think the general uh sort of uh, community of gamers don't technically realize it's a, a, a an english or a scottish in this case creation mm-hmm. you know and it's it's things like that that it's it's funny to see that a lot well, of developers and, do that and and like uh, uh red dead redemption which is all was also designed by rockstar north um mm. in conjunction with i think a san diego branch too but a big part of it was from rockstar north as well and that's another example where you know this is obviously steeped in like western west american west mythology i should specify and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's was developed at least in part by uh, you know a Scottish company. Well, I think part of that too, and I think um, a reason that culturally a lot of times you can have something made in the UK that feels American um, is even though our television is very different, I think our movie scene is very similar. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Bradley, but like Hollywood films are probably like the some of the bigger ones that come out in the UK, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. But we do have our own little sort of. Um uh, a British uh, like area that has a lot of filmmaking into it, which is cool as well. It's it's weird as well because it's like a lot of the obviously a lot of the films come from like Hollywood and like big mm-hmm. big companies, but a lot of the visual effects are actually done in Europe. It's mm-hmm. really strange. Like my my wife actually works for uh, a visual visual effects companies in London, um, and she worked on um, uh, the Batman v Superman, and she's currently working on Pirates of the Caribbean five. And you know, and this is a thing like um, because of that, uh, you'll find a lot of these films tend to have like little tidbits in them from lots of different cultures as well which is kind of interesting like there are a lot of the times they will have a different sort of studio that gives a different sort of flair or look to its part of the development and obviously sometimes you can tell where that's from at least from a a, a trained eye can and it's interesting that that sort of goes about it's um this is why i've always found it ludicrous that people thought that west was just you know everything but asia in a way, it seems so limited Japan, to do that. Because <clears throat> a lot of times when people yeah. talk about Eastern developers, they really just meant Japan. Um, oh, God, yeah. Well, I mean, for yeah. good reason, though. I mean, Japan were like, Japan were, and probably uh, probably not as much now, but they were the forefront of game de- development and game creation for a long, long, long time. So mm-hmm. it makes sense that, that, that you know, people would split them, because obviously, if you've ever played a Japanese or Asian game, you will immediately see the differences. I mean, it's very, they are very noticeably different yep. um, in er- almost every single way. Like, very rarely will, you, if you were to give someone a, a Japanese made game and then give someone, uh, a, sort of say, an American made game, you would be able to tell the differences like instantly. Even mm-hmm. if you were just playing them, the feel of them feels different. The yep. way it's sort of structured feels different you know regardless of whether the artwork's different or not you know it's 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 a very noticeable thing and i feel like we are as we've mentioned before it's been stunted 
by a little bit in terms of like say European gaming has because people will see them and they will just see Western or and then their brain will say Western and that will tie to America and then it kind of stops there. There's no mm-hmm. real sort of disconnect past there and that's that's something I've well been trying to split and show people that there is a there is a difference. You know, you guys mm-hmm. don't get everything. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get credit for everything. Damn it. <laughs> we will crawl something back, but no, it, it's 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 one of those uh, difficulties. Is that you know you can say it to you blue in the face to like a bunch of educated people like ourselves or in conferences, but trying to get the general populace and general gaming consumer to even sort of consider that is is a lot more difficult. And I'm hoping that this PhD will cause a um, a set. I've gone a bit preachy now. I apologise, but this <laughs> hoping my PhD will cause a precedent where people will actually start to give credit to. Um, developers around the world, you know, I mean, uh, for doing cool stuff. Like, uh, it, it, it's a shame when you see great companies like CD Projekt Red just get not not swept under the rug because they definitely weren't with Witcher, but they sort of were just sort of like they didn't really get any sort of thing of being a Polish developer. It was just like, here's CD Projekt Red's game, Witcher Three. It's amazing. Look how great it is. And then they didn't they didn't get any well, of the sort of cool acclaim as much as I think they deserved. Right. And Makes I think sense, yeah. I, I remember when when The Witcher Three came out and. Um, as, as we were talking about before, it was very steeped in Polish Polish culture and tradition and legends, mythology. Um, but there was there was some pushback initially from some people in the press that probably didn't really take the time to, to recognize that. That were saying, "Well, how come there's so many? How come there's just white people in Witcher?" Well, it's because they're specifically trying to be Polish. Like the idea is like this is specifically like one subset of people. That they're actually trying yeah. to represent because they're they're representing like their specific legends, and yeah. it was it sort of it sort of went unnoticed because the assumption was oh this is a Western game therefore it must be made I don't know if they thought it was made in America or Britain but there just there wasn't that sort of connection where um, this is specifically like specifically Polish culture specifically one one like country or one like region of the world. A small region of the world, not specifically. Oh, we're just making this game uh, with general, you know, Tolkien-esque mythology that has become this sort of um, large, amorphous blob kind of thing where we just kind of threw in everything at this point. Like, sort of happened with D and D. It's much mm. more, much more focused that I, I think really was lost on people that didn't take the time to actually play the game. Yeah, it's 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 it is as I've mentioned before, it is incredibly frustrating to see that sort of stuff. But again, it could also be played off as a bit of a compliment. Like, you know, when you feel like your game's up there with the big boys, almost. Mm -hmm. Um, Because the the perceptions of this East-West dichotomy is so strong. You know, if you say you're a top Western developer, it sounds more meaty than saying I'm a top European developer or a top Finnish developer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It sort of sells yourself a bit better. And and because people do have that split in head. Like, if you were to say, um, I work for the biggest company in in the eastern video game industry you know you sound like you're amazing you know you sound like you're great but if you say i work for a small subsection of uh like say china it does suddenly it doesn't sound that good anymore like um i i i've spoken to america mcgee who's Mm -hmm. currently in china with his company spicy horse games and american McGee is a really talented man and he's made a lot of really cool games over the years but when he says to people, "I'm in China and I'm I'm you know working on games with, you know Chinese uh, with Chinese developers and stuff like that," he it, he doesn't have that kick to it. Doesn't have that weight to it anymore because people's perceptions of say China and you know just that sort of area doesn't sound good. But if he says he's one of the top developers for uh, free to play games in Eastern countries, suddenly that includes that's like, Japan. <laughs> whoa it's like wow really that sounds amazing it's the same sort of thing mm-hmm. and and that's a smaller like sort of demographic in terms of this split so imagine trying to say that in you know in the western sort of side of it it's crazy it, it really it does it's severely limiting I'm, i I went to digra the other year where we met chris mm-hmm. and we were talking like to people and they were saying like you know there's so many big chunks of other areas of the world that are doing loads of stuff in games like we spoke to the guys in brazil and uh what was it Sa- uh, not saudi arabia what was it um do you remember what the lady said uh, we were talking about that one time i can't remember where it was um, but she was talking about the scene they had and it was it was south like, africa a, i think that was the one yes yeah. south africa scene was obscenely big like she was showing us stuff about it and we were we were just we were shocked because we didn't realize there was that much going on there right you know 
and it's and it's like there's that that's the sign of stuff that I want to get people starting to like sort of looking at and mm. sort of like doing research into because you know uh, I've the amount of times I've seen a damn paper or a thesis or a book written on like Western video game culture and mm. they have just basically ignored every single country bar like say maybe the UK at a stretch and America mm-hmm. it 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 gets frustrating. Because you know, we, I mean, even in those sometimes we basically were referred to as the fifty-first state almost. They were just like they're like, here's America, and then there's this other small English-speaking country of Britain doing some weird stuff as well. Puerto Rico <laughs> and uh, but, poor, poor Canada didn't see it lumped in with us too. Yeah, but again, That's true. Canada yeah, as Canada well. Gets Canada lumped in with the U.S. and they do their own stuff. Is which... yeah, Canada's lumped in with the U.S. They're part of North That's... America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's it's a string. It's like it's it's become like that though, and it's I don't think it's not really anyone's fault. I think it's just sort of how because no one bothered to sort of sit down and go right. This is this is this. This is that. This is this, and this is Western. This is this is Nordic, for example. Let's give it a name of the blue. Um, mm-hmm. No one bothered to do that when games started to take off as quickly as here because we all can agree games have. Uh, advanced with such absurd speed. It's it's incredible. Oh yeah. So no one really sort of had the time to sort of do that. I mean, if you look at say film. Take film, for example. Film came out, and immediately, we, after a couple of years, we started getting something referred to as world cinema, which was cinema that was from other areas of the world that weren't Hollywood. And mm. people weren't happy with that. They didn't want to be referred to as the world. They wanted to be <coughs> referred to as their country. So right. we got a golden age of, like, say, Japanese films, which inspired so much of our culture. Uh, cultural stuff, like, um, yeah, we got Godzilla. For example, uh, during mm. the 50s, we got, um, oh, what was the story called? I can't remember the name of the film, but it was the film that inspired George Lucas to make. That was uh, The Hidden Fortress? Yeah, The Hidden Fortress. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. It was and, The Hidden Fortress. Then, yes. Um, and that also inspired he, him to make Star Wars. Yes. And he also had uh, um, from the same, and oh, I can't believe I'm blanking on his uh, his name, the same the same famous Japanese director also did uh, Seven Samurai, which inspired yes. a lot of, which inspired Westerns here in the U.S., like Magnificent oh, gotcha. Seven, along with other films, too. Yeah. It, it they forced them by their by their the technical expertise and their like sort of mastery of the craft to make them go look we are not world cinema we are Japanese cinema you know, and we and, and a lot of countries started doing that and so nowadays if you were to refer to places as world cinema it'd be really insulting so it, it's kind of like if games just sort of unfortunately missed that step because we went really we were hit the point of like being the same sort of level of media as like say film stupidly quickly <laughs> so we missed it and I, that's kind of what i'm trying to do i'm kind of trying to sort of bring it back and be like look we need to sort of split this out a little bit more and sort of focus on this stuff and, and obviously to do that it's looking at the split of film the split of television comic books ma- comic books parallel with manga and things like that so it's uh it's tough work but i'm i'm determined to do it <laughs> very cool uh, so do you have like a uh, personal website or anything like you to point people to to see if they uh, wanted to read up a little bit more on it? Uh, I I have my uh, my well, my Twitter's at bsj um, and I have my website which is bsjcupo.wordpress.com. It's just a temporary website right now. And that's um, Kupo, uh, K-U-P-O. Yeah, that's K-U-P-O. Yeah, uh, it's it's because I'm I'm currently um, I'm lecturing at Staffordshire University as well as a game design lecturer mm. and. Uh, it's not that we're not allowed a portfolio website, but they kind of like us using the uh, university's page. And I'm still getting my page set up, so that's like a temporary page for me. <laughs> gotcha. uh, while I set up my like, lecturer bio on the, <laughs> on the website. So if you want to check out some of my stuff, all my papers are on there. All the work I've done, a little bit of work I've done in the industry is in there and stuff like that as well. So uh, you can check out my stuff that I've written there if you want to know more. That sounds great. Yeah, and... We really appreciate it again. You co- you joining us and talking to us about uh, European developers and the difference between uh, just the different cultural influences from countries in the West and regions of the world that, like you said, a lot of people don't think about. Yeah, it's really adjusted my thinking on the whole topic. Yeah, <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you guys as well because you know it's uh, it's nice to talk about this. It's nice to sort of get people sort of thinking, you know, to get people mm. appreciating as well. Because that's the that, at the end of the day, that's what we all want, isn't it? We want our we want our industry to appreciate everyone in it you know as, right. as i think most people would mm-hmm. so that's 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 a great thing and embrace embrace those differences that we talked about too you know mm, definitely it'd be games would be so boring if they were all designed the same way mm-hmm. oh my god well, yeah. yeah just imagine if they were all uh flying feet or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> aliens and, well, aliens monsters. and monsters that sounds like well, a, that sounds like a youtube poop i swear to god that sounds like look at the aliens and monsters attacking <laughs> Well, hey, you, get, you have two options there. Aliens, monsters, you know? Great. <laughs> That's it. You get no Choice. other choices. <laughs> Nothing else scary at all. 
Well, thank everyone for joining us for episode number 64 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And I've been Brad. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.